Buzz Richo with Graham Richardson. And welcome to Rich Over This Week. I must say, I, I walked into the tally room the other night, hopeful of a Labor victory, probably expecting a Labor victory. I wasn't certain, but I was pretty hopeful. I, I thought, this, this is our time. But the power of prayer apparently was too good for us. Scott Morrison just, uh, I, I think, thumped us. He did really, really well. So my congratulations go to Scott. Uh, if we're going to get beaten, I like to get beaten by a good bloke, and I like him, despite his support for the Sharks. He's not a bad bloke. And uh, I think um, it's good to have an honourable man leading you, no matter, no matter who it is. And so I, I wish him well. I spare a thought for Bill Shorten. Worked, worked hard. But, um, you know, you get rejected and your, your career fundamentally ends. This is a brutal business. A really brutal business. And um, I... I have on my, my right uh, a man called Anthony Albanese who's um, about to, to take up the, the cudgels in this race and become Labor leader and in three years' time hopefully become Australia's Prime Minister. Welcome to the show, Alba. Thanks for having me on, Graeme. Oh, I, no, I should have called you Anthony. I should sort of, there should be some respect there. <laughs> now. I mean, you're, you're a, a leader a, now. Alba's fine, mate. I've got a, Alba's <laughs> fine, isn't it good? Now, how do you approach it? Uh, we've got, you know, the Labor Party's been rejected a couple of times in a row. Three. They, they like Scott Morrison. Uh, there's no doubt about that. The, the, I think he's proven that. Uh, he, uh, he outdid the polls. Uh, the polls have lost a lot of their clout, I think, mm. from, from now on. So how do you unseat a bloke? Because there, there's a lot of differences between you and Scott. You're not exactly the same guys. Uh, we're certainly not. Uh, I mean, the, the, the first thing that we have to do is acknowledge our, our defeat. And uh, sometimes that can be hard for people to look for, you know, excuses and it was the media's fault or it was someone else's fault. We've got to accept responsibility collectively and myself included in that uh, for uh, the policies that we put forward and the campaign that we ran simply weren't good enough. So there's no good worry about the ref's decision. The scoreboard's up there and, uh, and, and we lost. We got one in three votes of Australians. And we need to lift that. That needs to really have a, a four in front uh, rather than a, a 33 is what we should be the, aiming for. The primary for. vote was pretty terrible. It was it? a terrible primary vote. And, uh, of course, in, in some states it was, it was worse than one in three. In Queensland, uh, our primary vote had a two in front of it. And, and that simply isn't good enough. So Queensland's always a problem. It, the Labor Party. Federally, in the election, but, somebody's got a story about why Labor didn't do well in Queensland this time. But but what the uh, the state results with uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk's government, with Anna Bly, Peter Beattie, Wayne Goss, they've all led Labor governments in recent periods, relatively recent periods in Queensland. So it's not like they're not prepared to ever vote Labor. Uh, so we need to have a good look at it. Uh, we need to look at other areas where we didn't do well. Uh, Western Australia, uh, our vote there remains dismally low. And if you compare that with the efforts of the McGowan government, again, it shows that people in, in the West are, are prepared to vote Labor and give us a go if it's a program they believe in. But not federally. I mean, it seems to me in Western Australia it's a gunner state. It's always going to vote Labor. <laughs> it just doesn't get around to it. Um, and it seems to me federally, time and time again, Labor looks to, to the Western Australia, especially when, when things are going bad early in the night and there's only Western <laughs> Australia to come. You, hope. you want miracles from the West. Well, we were, we were looking for a miracle from the West on, uh, on, on Saturday. Saturday night. Look, look, one of the things I think is that uh, federal government, when people look at it, it's about the economy. So we need to acknowledge, I think, that we need to explain our position much better of how we'll create wealth, not just how we'll share wealth. Uh, because unless you're growing the pie, uh, then uh, sharing it becomes a, a, a case of diminishing returns. And uh, we have, I, I think, there were a range of policies that we took to the election uh, that were very positive about job creation. But we had so many messages 
out there, I don't think it, it really cut through. Uh, what uh, Scott Morrison did was a very effective campaign, I thought. I remember uh, the first time I heard him talking about uh, a, a three-letter slogan, T-A-X, I thought, uh-oh, that's effective, that'll cut through and stick with people. And uh, we had a, a bold program because we wanted to do big things in, in health, in education, in infrastructure. Uh, clearly, though, we, we got some things wrong. We'll need to examine all of those policies. We'll need to examine all of the campaign. Uh, we need to do it in a way which doesn't point any fingers at anyone, which says all of us are responsible. Uh, you know, I'm a senior member of the Labor Party, so we're, we're all except uh, responsible for the, for the outcome. I, I, what I'd say to you on that score, though, is that it seems to me you, you've made a lot of enemies in the over-60s community, hmm. right? I, it's not... And it's way beyond the normal divide of Australian politics. Labor's doing very poorly with them. Yeah. How do you address that? Well, one of the things that, that we clearly uh, should have... Uh, thought through in, in more detail was the impact of the, uh, the dividend changes. Um, many people were saying to me that uh, they only got two or three thousand dollars, but that that two and three thousand dollars was the difference of how, how they paid their rates. How they pay, went for an overseas holiday or a holiday domestically up the coast at the end of the year. It made a big difference to them and they'd factored that into their retirement. And because of that, uh, there was a, a view somehow that we were saying they'd done something wrong. So it became not just about the economics, it became about uh, the morality of, of what they'd done. And they'd done nothing wrong in terms of they'd complied with the rules. Uh, we were proposing to, to change the rules. And, and that had a big backlash. And uh, members, uh, many members I spoke to, uh, uh, Susan Templeman, and in the last couple of days, I mean, she was uh, telling people about that, um, and, and we didn't respond really appropriately uh, about that. There were a range of things we could have considered. Look, the amount of money, I understand the motivation for it, the amount of money that we're giving uh, to people who aren't paying any tax through this measure is around about, is approaching $6 billion pretty soon. Now, that's more money than we give to public schools, so it's, it's a significant impact. I understand why, uh, why we were motivated uh, to look for revenue so that we could make that social expenditure in particular that we wanted to do. But, but it had an impact on people that, that just made them pretty angry at us and uh, they expressed that anger uh, on Saturday. Yeah, they expressed it in the ballot box. Um, when you look at uh, across the board, uh, industrial relations did not seem to me to play the kind of role that a lot of people had expected it to do. It was a relatively minor issue on Saturday, wasn't it? It was, and we had, again there, we need to examine uh, why it is that when you talk to people about issues like penalty rates, we want to talk about the impact in outer suburbs and in regional areas. Taking people's penalty rates away is a, is a big hit. Really big. And, uh, you know, it, it's what people need to survive on. And we didn't hit that home strongly enough. Uh, we didn't, uh, I, I don't think, uh, you know, and it, once again, I'm, I'm not blaming anyone else for this. I was one of the people travelling around the country talking about these issues. But penalty rates and, and the unfairness, the, the, there's a great deal of concern out there in the community about the casualisation of work, about the fact that real wages aren't increasing, about the pressures that are on in terms of living standards. Uh, we know that there's massive underemployment. That is, people can't get the number of hours that they want to put food on the table for their family and to pay for the essentials of life. Now, there's a real, there, uh, there was a real opportunity. I thought it would be much, much bigger and much more effective. We had the union movement uh, working very strongly uh, on the, those issues and campaigning strongly. I think we got the fundamentals of our IR policy right and, and the fact that the coalition couldn't attack them and, and didn't attack them it reinforces that. So I think that, that idea of fairness in the workplace and changing the rules was the slogan. I'm not sure, though, that people got yeah. through exactly what that meant in terms of that. That balance is a bit out of whack between uh, workers 
and employers and, and quite clearly, though we, it didn't have the electoral impact which we were hoping it would. No, it's, I, I looked uh, around on, on Saturday night for comfort <laughs> and I wasn't finding... Gilmore! <laughs> I wasn't finding much, yes, Gilmore, but there, there, there wasn't much around. And, and that, what surprised me was that Labor didn't really seem to do well anywhere. You know, Victoria was supposed to deliver us yet more, even oh. though it's already, one would have thought, pretty strong Labor state. Um, you know, you, you looked around, our vote just wasn't going anywhere, anywhere. Was it? Yeah, I, I, I was on one of the programs too, uh, Graham, on, uh, on a commercial network. Uh, we won't give them a free ad on, uh, on Saturday night. And it was pretty difficult sitting there and uh, getting the results through. And, and you know things are going bad. I'll say this to you. I'm sure that you had people feeding you results. Yep. Uh, mine were coming from some of the, the central campaigns. You know things are going bad when, when your, uh, your phone stops getting, getting the messages and the numbers through. And, it's, it's, uh, it's funny and, you said that. And that's what happened. Because at around about 8 o'clock, my phone just stopped ringing very much. <laughs> it, it rang, but not often. Whereas on other election nights, it drives you mad trying, yeah. to, trying to keep up with it. So, uh, I mean, obviously people knew. Um, but it, it, well, so it, was, it was a tough night. And, and what, uh, you know, one of the things that motivates me isn't, uh, you know, I care, I care very much about those very fine people who've, who've lost their seats. Uh, you know, Susan Lamb and Cathy O'Toole and Justine Kay and, um, you know, potentially other candidates who were running expecting uh, to, to win. Uh, but I also, in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, more important, I think, uh, perhaps, is that those people who are just the volunteers who give up, you know, months of their time, ringing people, knocking on doors, putting things in, in letterboxes, and they all expected us to win. So it was, it was quite devastating. And uh, a number of people, when I got to uh, my, uh, my party at Peter Shem RSL, there were some people there who were pretty shattered. And uh, we, the Parliamentary Labor Party, uh, let them down. Yeah, it's funny, cos uh, uh, I've had a few people ring me in the last few days who are still shattered. Um, there, there are a lot of Labor people who... There sure are. There, I think it's one of those times when you think you're going to win, uh, especially if you're a punter out there and, and, and it doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, it, it gets very disappointed. And obviously we've got a lot of people in the, in the Labor movement who, who are out there, uh, around, you know, uh, always trying to, to uh, urge you on and to barrack for you. Well, Graham, of course, in, uh, you know, in, in our lifetimes, post-war period, We've only, we've only done it three times, 72, 83 and 2007. So it doesn't happen very often that Labor goes from opposition into government. And uh, I'm uh, perhaps crazy brave enough uh, to uh, what, suggest what that... What can you do that's different that'll make you the fourth person? Well, I think one of the things that I, that I have, hopefully, Graham, you've seen me in a number of environments, uh, not just in the cities, but up in Townsville. I've liked and... you in some, and I haven't been doing <laughs> it in others, but there you go. But I'll always have a crack. That's right. You and always that's, do. That's one of the things that I'll do. Scott Morrison will know he's in a parliament if I'm leader of the opposition. Uh, I will hold the government to account vigorously. I'll, I'll do it in a way that's professional, uh, but in a way that doesn't let him off the hook. I will pursue uh, as well uh, with the caucus a, uh, a, a, a policy agenda. Uh, we have to really look, examine what, what we're doing. One of the things that gives me hope, I've got to say, is that I look at our side and our team and I look at the team opposite. I don't know how they fill the cabinet. Uh, they have cabinet ministers there who, who they had to hide during the election campaign. Now, surely they can't reappoint people like Melissa Price and others who, who it, were incapable it, it, of will. doing a doorstop. Well, we'll wait and see, but they, uh, they will have trouble surviving uh, the scrutiny that they'll be put under. Uh, this government now, Scott Morrison's been elected. Uh, he has a team to put together. I think that will be very difficult for him. Uh, we have a really talented group of people um, across the board on the front bench, but also on the back bench. And some of, the, some of those will, will no doubt uh, step forward over a period of time. I think the people that we've elected 
at uh, the previous couple of elections uh, have been outstanding. Some of them, those have, have stepped up already, but others will continue to progress through the ranks and get more prominence. Tell me, um, when you, you think of, of, uh, of, of ways forward, uh, of how, we, uh, you, how you, you set the Labor Party up to, to, to do better, um, some of the, the obvious weaknesses that we've had, some of the policies that did us, that did us harm. Now, whether, I don't know whether you know, how much you, you love them or not, but, but the franking credit stuff and, uh, and the negative gearing stuff, they just... It's almost like you, you're determined not to win when you, you produce policies like this because they just scare people. If you frighten the horses, you, you don't do so well. Uh, how do you stop sometimes in the Labor Party but something that's very popular with the party faithful, but nonetheless is not real popular with the rest of the electorate. How do you balance that? Well, that, that, that is a, a great challenge, but it's one, I think, that uh, with proper reflection and, and proper structures uh, should be addressed. Uh, every time there's a policy, uh, the examination should be what's the impact, what's the downside, not just what's the upside, and uh, you need to do that. Uh, we need also, I think, to go out. Part of the process that will happen uh, from now is going out there and, and listening, not just to people who are our party members, but uh, important that we do listen to them, but also uh, to people who didn't vote for us, uh, who aren't the faithful, and, uh, but who pot are potentially uh, ours. So we need to get, get those people, either get them to return, get them back, or get them for the first time. And I notice you've talked about a listening tour. Well, I, I, I'm making the point there that, that uh, people in politics were often busy talking. Often we've got to stop to listen, to listen to what they're saying. Because unless you do, you get to listen on election night. We did some listening Saturday night and there were some pretty clear messages coming through. And uh, the message was that we weren't good enough as a team and the tragedy of that, that is, I think, that, you know, person for person, and part of what government, as you know, Graeme, part of it's about the personnel and their capacity to be good ministers. The, our ministerial team, I think, would have been outstanding. An outstanding cabinet, outstanding junior ministers, outstanding people coming through and putting pressure on people to perform. And I think it would have been uh, a, a very good government if we had have been elected. We, we didn't get there. Uh, but uh, some of the, the, the talent and the capacity uh, remains. And what I want to do is to harness that capacity. And one of the things that, that, that I think I can do and I've been prepared to do for a long period of time is to uh, stand up and say, often against uh, a majority in my own uh, faction or my own party, and, and say what I think uh, regardless of whether people are going to pat me on the back over it. And I'll, I'll continue uh, to do that. Uh, one of my, um, my themes, if you like, of, of my candidacy for the leadership is what you see is what you get. I think I'm a pretty common sense person. I, I get around, I talk to a lot of people and I listen to a lot of people as well. Yeah, it's, well, I, I think you are all of those things. Um, and. God knows we'll need you to be because this is this is not an easy task. I mean, lifting Labor up from the floor uh, and 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 beating Morris is now out of a few wins in a row and it, you know it's cock a hoop and and is obviously popular. Now you know it, the image of that you see of him as the the shark's cap at the at at the football. Um, you you obviously you're a South Sydney supporter, so you you're another one who who supports them, but. He's got that sort of homespun image that people just seem to like. Um, uh, how do you crack uh, that? Uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you a footy analogy, <laughs> Graham, yeah. which you won't mind. Um, you know, I was on the South board when we got kicked out of the comp. Uh, that, let me tell you, people were as devastated by that decision as Labor faithful were on Saturday night. There were. There were tears. I remember, yeah. It, it was a shocker. Now, I could have at that time, and those of us who were directors of the club said, oh, well, this is too hard, uh, we lost and, and we're out. We didn't. We went out there, we picked ourselves up, we organised for 100,000 people to march in the streets, we mobilised support, 
We engaged the community. We had a clear message as well about football being about identity and who people are and belonging to a community. It wasn't just about uh, profits. Remember the marches and, and things. And, and we, did, we had a good message and we articulated it. We did it strongly. We brought people with us. We negotiated in the end uh, with people who were not on our side in the dispute and we got back and we're now on top of the comp. Uh, the fact is that if you... You if, have to say that, didn't you? If you are... Uh, I just had to get that in, Graham. Yeah, so I can see that. Where, where, you know, I, I have... Uh, if you look at my life, it's one of, uh, you know, overcoming odds. That was one of the times where my involvement overcame odds. Uh, I don't think that leading the Labor Party back in a government will be easy. It's a big challenge, but it's one that uh, I'm up for, and I hope that I receive the support of the caucus and of the party to do it. Oh, mate, you, you, you'll certainly get that. There's a, a grab of Chris Bowen that in my ear, everyone tells me we've got to watch. Uh, hmm. um, let's have a look. I also wanted to, to ensure, through the leadership process, that the party urgently deals with the matter of people of faith in our community not feeling that the Labor Party talks to them. I've noticed as I've been around during the election campaign and even um, in the days since as people have stopped me in the street to wish me the best uh, in the leadership ballot or just stop to talk about what happened in the election, how often it has been raised with me that people of faith no longer feel that progressive politics cares about them. These are people with a social conscience who want to be included in the progressive movement. We need to tackle this urgently. People of faith, what do you say to that? What I say to that is, is that people of faith need to be respected. Uh, Chris Bowen's right. And that's one of the reasons why uh, there's no one in the, in the parliament uh, who has been a stronger supporter of marriage equality than I was over a long period of time. I spoke in my first speech about uh, removing discrimination on the basis of someone's sexuality, along with race and gender and other issues. Um, and that's why, even though that was my position, I respected people who disagreed with me. And in particular, I supported a conscience vote. I did it strongly. Uh, there weren't too many of my close friends were doing that. I did it publicly, consistently, uh, throughout uh, national executive, national conferences and throughout our public forums. And I did that because you shouldn't put someone in a position of choosing between the faith that they genuinely hold and the love that they have for the Labor Party. And people felt as though if we had have had a binding decision there, what we would have been saying is... Uh, if you don't support marriage equality, you don't have a place in the Labor Party. And literally, in terms of under our rules, it would have meant that for parliamentarians. Uh, so I, I very strongly held that position. Uh, I did it consistently. And that's what drove me. I, I'm very close to uh, particularly uh, the communities like the Greek Orthodox community, the Maronite Christian community uh, in my electorate, uh, the Islamic community. Uh, I have a big uh, Muslim alawite. Uh, population. And uh, all of those uh, were saying to me about this as an issue. And one of the things I've found is that if, if you treat people with respect, uh, they'll respect the view that you have, even if they don't agree with it. So marriage equality was an example uh, of that. And, you know, I, I've been very consistent. I, I, a strong... oh, I, I, I've got to give you consistency on it. How is the Labor Party going to be different under Anthony Albanese? I think you'll find us emphasising uh, far more uh, basic issues, if you like, if you want to term it that way. Um, jobs, how we get the economy to grow, how you engage in the future as well. What's the, the future look like in terms of employment? Uh, what's the impact of new technology? How does a... Uh, how do we transition in a way that helps working people? So you can't stop change. What government can do, though, is manage change in the interests of people and bring people with you, because people are, uh, can be quite scared by change, uh, but you've got to be prepared to 
engage with them and talk with them and come up with policies that they can relate to. I mean, I doubt whether many people out there had heard of, uh, I'm sure some had, if they were directly involved, but imputation, the idea that imputation of dividends uh, would be a major electoral issue in Australia is not one that we uh, would, many people would I have seen coming. I think 10 years ago, if you just said <laughs> that, I'd, I'd have told you you were mad. Uh, look, I've, I've got to leave it there, but uh, I'm, I'm looking at Labor's future right now and uh, I wish you the very best. Um, it's no great secret I might be a Labor supporter. <laughs> and uh, I, I'd have to say, Anthony, I'm delighted that you're the one who's going to take up the cudgels. I'm, I think uh, you've earned it. I think you'll be a terrific leader. You have my absolute support. Whatever I can do for you, you let me know. Thank you, mate. Good on you. Anthony Albanese. Well.